Hi guys, welcome to Twin Perspective. I'm Joe, and tonight I'm going to be presenting my story for a reboot for Friday the 13th. We're happening upon October. It is the best season in the world for film. What better way to kick it off than to sit back, grab a cup of Joe, you know, maybe grab a pack of Joe's, Sit down with Joe as I go through my retelling of Friday the 13th. This video will be Act 1, featuring Pamela Voorhees. Stay tuned to the channel for Act 2 and Act 3. Act 2 will be Jason growing up in the woods, and Act 3 will be Jason following in his mother's footsteps. This story is my original story, and of course it is based on the films and all of the wonderful characters and events created by Ron Kurtz and Victor Miller and Sean Cunningham. So sit back and relax as I present to you Act 1 of Friday the 13th. It's early in July, 1957. We are at Camp Crystal Lake. The last of the buses filled with happy children are leaving Camp Crystal Lake. It has been another successful summer at the camp for the owners, David and Louise Christie. Now, David and Louise must prepare to clean and restore the camp before the long winter to come. David and Louise get commitments from the eight counselors who have worked that, there that summer. They've gotten commitments from these eight counselors to stay for an additional two days and pitch in. The meals will be prepared by Pamela Voorhees, the camp's cook, and the repairs and the cleanup will be directed by Longtime friend of the Christie's, Bob. Bob helped the Christie's establish Camp Crystal Lake way back in 1935. We are in 1957. On this particular final day of the season, there are two children who remain at the camp. Stephen Christie is 11 years old. He is the son of David and Louise. Stephen has spent every summer of his life at the camp with his parents. The other child remaining is Jenny Field. She's also 11. Jenny is the daughter of Danny and Debbie Field, and they live on the north end of the lake. Jenny has been a camper at Camp Crystal Lake for two years now, and because her parents are friends with the Christies, she gets to spend extra time there. She's waiting for her family to pick her up this afternoon. They're going to be there shortly. Now, Crystal Lake, New Jersey is a very small town, and most of its residents live in the center of town about three miles away from the lake. The lake it itself is almost a half a mile long, and in some spots, it's about a quarter mile wide. It is surrounded by miles of woods. There are residents who live, live scattered throughout the woods, but very few. And uh, few of them have access to the lake. The main residents around the lake are the Field family, which owns about a third of it in the northern section. Then you've got Camp Crystal Lake, which occupies the southern end of the lake. And to the east, you have Packinac Lodge, which uh, can serve as a, a summer camp, but it's uh, mostly used for other things, as I will get to. The counselors who worked this summer and who are going to stay for the additional two days are all young adults. They're all above 21 years old. We have head counselors Barry and Claudette. 
Mary and Claudette are 24. They volunteered at the camp for a couple of years now. They're going to be joined by Jack. He's our athletic country boy. And his girlfriend, Marcy, who is uh, the voluptuous country girl. We've got Ned. He's a goofball. We've got Brenda. She's mature, and she's also responsible as long as she's on the clock. We've got Bill, and he's a mature, responsible, hardworking man, young adult. And we have sweet Alice, sweet and naive. Alice has the hots for Bill. Ned has the hots for Marcy, but they're, uh, pardon me, Brenda. Ned has the hots for Brenda, but that's never going to come to fruition. And Barry and Claudette are, cu are a couple, and we also have Jack and Marcy, who are a couple. Working at the camp for the extra two days doesn't bother the group. They're pretty excited about it because uh, they have access to the lake and the grounds now without the actual responsibility of taking care of campers. And since they're all of drinking age, they all plan on staying there overnight and partying like it's nobody's business. Late nights are going to occur. Now, expecting Jenny's parents to arrive any minute, a different vehicle pulls up to the camp. It's Mrs. Cunningham. She is the nanny who takes care of Pamela's son, Jason while Pamela spends her days at the camp. Mrs. Cunningham is visibly shaken, but she doesn't want to cause a scene. She has Jason in the back seat. She tells Pamela that Jason has killed her cat, and she thinks it was intentional. As a matter of fact, she thinks Jason might have trapped the cat first and then killed it. Now, Mrs. Cunningham has taken care of Jason for 11 years. And this is uh, something that has <laughs> broken this camel's back. She's offering her resignation. She's sincere, but she's not going to reconsider. Now, Jason's never used to being out in public. He's covered himself with a large brown beach towel. And he's keeping his head completely obscured from view. He gets out of the car and he goes up to his mom, Pamela, and Pamela's telling Jason that everything's going to be okay, everything's fine. But she's still pleading for Miss Cunningham to reconsider, but Miss Cunningham books it. She's gone. So Mrs. Christie and Pamela start to discuss the current situation. Pamela cannot leave Jason unattended. So she contemplates going home. She says she's sorry, but she's not going to be able to work for the next two days at the camp. She has to stay with Jason during the day. And Louise says, well, she has an option. If Pamela and Jason would like to stay in the cabin that's closest to the galley for the next two days. While Pamela cooks, Louise says she will personally stay in the cabin with Jason and watch him and make sure that everything will be fine. Pamela would feel more comfortable if Jason joined her in the galley every time she cooked. The cooking requires a fair amount of attention, and she also fears somebody might see him. She fears that strangers will not treat her very peculiar son well. So Barry uh, and Claudette approach. They're trying to get the agenda together for the next two days. Well, they introduce Jason to Barry, but Jason's covered in this blanket. Um, Pamela defends Jason, saying it's perfectly normal for a 10-year-old to be shy. And Barry freaks out because Jason is a huge kid. Barry thinks, are you kidding me? That kid is 10 years old. You know, he looks like he's 17. As Christy tells Barry to join the others, she'll be there in a second. At some point in this film, I feel like it should be explained that Jason was born with 
hydrocephalus. He's got an enlarged skull. He has some mental disabilities. And he has severe facial deformities. Although he's 10 years old and his birthday's coming up in two days, he has the body of a much older teen. Pamela expects, excuse me, Pamela explains to Mrs. Christie that Jason's father, who we will call Elias, was an abusive father. He was an abusive, pardon me, husband. Pamela claims to have left this relationship with Elias while she was pregnant with Jason. She moved to Crystal Lake right before she gave birth. Pamela asserts that Elias tried to kill her when she was pregnant. Elias set their trailer on fire back in Ohio, and Elias skipped town. He thought he killed Pamela and her unborn son. Well, Pamela says she survived. She took the savings she had, and she moved to Crystal Lake. They purchased the very modest house that's right outside the city limits, and... Pamela was a short order cook for the local cafe. That's when she met Mr. and Mrs. Christie. They admired her courage and strength as a single mother, and they knew she would make an excellent cook at their camp. Mr. and Mrs. Christie have met Jason before. From the start of their relationship, all agreed Jason should not be around the other kids at the camp, which is why Pamela has employed Mrs. Cunningham for the last 11 years. However, since the Actual campers have left. Pamela and Louise hope that the counselors will show maturity and consideration, courtesy and confidentiality for the Voorhees family. Pamela asserts to Louise right from the beginning, don't let Jason go by the lake. He's not a very good swimmer. Louise Christie escorts Pamela and Jason to the cabin where they're going to stay for the next two days. Little Stephen Christie and little uh, Jenny are watching and they ask uh, Stephen's parents questions. They ask David, the father, questions about Jason. Jason has taken an interest in Jenny. We need to emphasize that he... Uh, when they get in the cabin, Jason actually peers out the window, staring at Jenny, when Jenny starts to get in her parents' car to leave. Jenny looks back towards the window, and Jason has moved the towel away so he can get a better view, and they both get a pretty good look at each other. Louise gathers all the counselors outside by the lake. She tells them they're going to work their normal hours for the day under the direction of David and longtime friend Bob. She tells them to avoid the cabin where Pamela and Jason are residing. And she tells them if they get enough work done today, she'll let them off early and they can have a bonfire by the lake. They won't be able to do it both nights. They'll be able to do it tonight if they get enough work done. Naturally, they, the counselors can stay on the premises. They're all adults. They live in the surrounding towns. None of them wants to get drunk and drive home and drive back the next morning. They're all going to stay at the camp. And, uh, yeah, the counselors expect to be drunk pretty quick. In the short car ride home for Jenny and her family, Jenny asks her parents about Jason. They know the story well. And they explain as much as they can. And little Jenny wants to return to the camp the next day. She thinks she can volunteer and help out even with Jason. The parents find the gesture sweet and sincere. And they promise Jenny that they'll bring her back in the morning. Now at the camp, Bob has the counselors working hard. The boys are cutting limbs on trees that surround the buildings. The girls are cleaning the cabins. In particular positions of authority are Barry and Claudette. They act like observant managers rather than active participants in the labor. And at one point, Barry manipulates Bob into leaving the work to go do some executive stuff. 
coordinating. And Claudette does the same with the girls. And Louise isn't there because Louise is watching Jason in the cabin. So uh, Claudette gets to sneak off as well. Of course, Mary and Claudette instead meet at a designated spot. It's an attic above a shed that is between the galley and the cabin where the Borges are staying. But they sneak in, they've done it often, and they begin their lovemaking. And this is a slasher film, so it should include a lot of sex, a lot of alcohol consumption, a lot of nudity, blatant, full frontal nudity. While the boys or counselors are working, they ask Bob about Jason. Bob really doesn't know Jason personally, only what he's heard over the years. But he says that Jason is a calm boy, but he needs special attention due to his affliction. He says that Jason is not dumb, he's just slow. And then seemingly to take a shot at their current work output, he tells them that Jason is stronger than all of them. Of course, they're in their 20s and Jason's only 11. Um, the girls, while doing their work, entertain a discussion about Jason as well. Alice feels like it's no big deal. She might even volunteer to watch Jason if need be. Marcy's not having anything to do with that. Marcy won't volunteer any extra time. And she reminds the girls there that they're not supposed to have counselors right now. And that's what she, are campers right now, and that's what she considers Jason a camper. Mary and Claudette finish their lovemaking, working so hard. And uh, they exit their secret location, and on their way past the Voorhees cabin, they decide to stop and peer inside the window. They want to get a good look at Jason. Well, Mrs. Voorhees, Pamela's working in the galley, but she can see clearly the kids exiting the shed, and then she sees the kids staring in her cabin. So the kids are busted. They just don't know it yet. Um, Claudette looks into the cabin, and she sees Jason lying on the bed, but Jason's got his back turned. But she sees that his skull is very deformed. And then Louise steps into the window and busts the kids, tells them to get back to work. Uh, Jason gets up, and part of the routine that they've planned is Louise is going to work with Jason on some puzzles. And she has the puzzles spread out on a table, and Jason sits down, and he's able to figure the puzzles out pretty quickly. Claudette rejoins the girls as they're washing clothes. Alice asks Claudette what happened, why it took so long. Claudette acts like uh, there were wrinkles that needed to be straightened out in the agenda. And Claudette also says she saw Jason and she thought that he didn't look human. Barry rejoins the boys just as they're finishing loading all the branches into the truck. How about that? Uh, Bob says that after lunch, they're going to have to mow and rake every inch of the grounds. At that moment, Pamela Voorhees rings the lunch bell. Everybody goes to lunch. We get a nice little moment with David Christie and his son, Stephen. They're fishing at the lakeside. They're at this single pier with this single light. At the end of it, um, Stephen tells his father that Jenny's coming back tomorrow and they're, they're going to hang out all day while they're working at the camp. Um, David knows Stephen's, his kid likes Jenny. They're 11 years old now. They've been friends forever, their whole lives, but they're getting to that age now. And so David's kind of wondering whether... Stephen considers Jenny his girlfriend or not. Stephen's like, ooh, no. But anyway, Jenny's not like all the other girls. And David's like, really? How so? Stephen says, well, Jenny, 
she's not scared of everything like other girls. She'll, I've seen her catch a frog. I've seen her catch a lizard. She even baits her own hook and she takes the fish off by herself. And David laughs and tells his son, you know, that's Jenny's what we call a tomboy. And uh, Stephen says, yeah, I like her, you know, not, not like her, like her, but I like her. It's afternoon. The work is over. The counselors have finished their job. It is in the afternoon. They have gotten off early. Everyone's in their swimming gear and they're at the lake. Barry and Claudette are cuddled together in the water, contemplate, uh, complimenting themselves on a great day of work. Yeah. Jack and Marcy, they're a couple. They're in the water holding themselves as well. And on the shoreline, you have Alice, and she's talking to Bill. They haven't hooked up yet. And you also have Marcy and Ned. Uh, Ned's making the moves on Marcy once again, but she's not having it. Pamela finishes her work and she enters the cabin. Uh, Louise is there. Pamela, uh, Jason immediately goes to Pamela. I don't know if the writers want Jason to be able to talk or not, but I think at 11 years old, he would at least be able to address his mother. Uh, so I wouldn't mind if Jason said mama every time he saw his mama. I think it would be kind of endearing and sad at times. But if you guys are fanatics and you don't want Jason to speak at all, and he doesn't speak. Pamela and Jason hug. Pamela asks Louise, how was he? Louise says he was fine. He took his nap right when he said he would. He woke up right when he said he would. We worked on the puzzles after lunch. He figured all of them out, every single one of them. Pamela says, well, Jason is smarter than people realize. Pamela kisses Jason on his head. And Pamela tells Jason, you're my angel. You're my reason for living. You're every thought in my head. You're every beat of my heart. There's a knock at the door. Jason hides behind his mother so no one can see his deformed face. Louise answers the door. It's David and Stephen. They're there to get Louise. They're going to drive home. Louise and David tell Pamela bye. And then little Stephen decides to tell Jason goodbye, trying to be sweet. And Jason kind of peers from behind his mom just long enough to, to get a good look at Stephen and Stephen to get a good look at Jason. And poor little Stephen can't, can't act how he feels when he sees how deformed Jason is. He's terrified. Then we go to night. Bob is going to stay with the counselors, make sure they don't burn the place down. He's probably going to have a beer or two, too. But he's in charge of the counselors since Louise and David are gone. The young adults are all drinking. They're all singing. Bill plays the guitar. Uh, inside Pamela and Jason's cabin. You can hear the noise, the faint singing in the distance, and Jason standing by the window. It's almost as if he's trying to get a glimpse of what all the action is going on outside. Pamela tells Jason not to worry about those other kids. She says, I know what you're thinking. She said, I know everything that you think, even when you were a little bitty in mama's belly. It may sound like those kids are having a good time, but they're not. They're on a dark path to sin and misery and irresponsibility. She tells Jason to come lay down. She covers him up with the blankets. And before she leaves his bed, she rubs his head and she hums a melody to him. And the melody should be from 1946, a song called To Each His Own. It's a nice melody and the lyrics fit. Um, 
later in the night, we go back to the campfire. Everyone's scattered. The only people left there are Ned. He's passed out. Bob has to wake him up. Bob brings Ned back to the boys' cabin. Now the whole summer, all of the boys' counselors stayed in one cabin. All of the girls' counselors stayed in one cabin. Uh, Ned gets Bob leads Ned back to the boys' cabin. Ned climbs in bed, and we see that Bill is already asleep because Bill's pretty mature. And in the girls' cabin, we see that Brenda's asleep, but also Alice. Sweet, naive Alice is asleep. But in another cabin, you have Barry and Claudette making love. And in yet another cabin, we have Jack and Marcy. During the lovemaking, Marcy notices a figure by the cabin window. It's actually Jason. Jason staring at the couple. Marcy screams. Jack jumps up. He runs to the window. But no one's there. Jack insists that it was either Bill or Ned for sure, playing a joke. Brenda said, no, it was a monster. And Jack explains, there's no monsters, of course. It's Bill or Ned screwing around. And uh, Marcy, Marcy says, uh, oh, maybe it was Jason. And it's a pretty grim thought <laughs> that you would see a kid and think it's a monster. Now, I think from the point of view of Jason, we should see him running back to his cabin at a very fast pace. He gets into the cabin, slams the door closed, jumps under his covers. His mom wakes up. She notices the cabin door is closed. She looks over. She sees the blanket settling on Jason, but he's pretending to sleep. She knows he's awake. She tries to get him to wake up, perhaps by saying something like, Jason, mother is talking to you. But Jason doesn't respond. But she confronts him in the morning. She asks Jason where he went last night. Jason looks down. He's not going to say anything. Pamela asked him if he saw anything. Did you see the counselors doing anything? At that point, Jason spots his brown beach towel and puts it over his head. He's very embarrassed. Pamela said, it might look like fun to you, but it's not. As a matter of fact, your father used to do that to me all the time. He'd pin me down, he'd hold me down, and he would hurt me. And every time he did it, it hurt. And any man that would do that is not a man. And any woman that would let a man do that is a whore. Pamela says, I know it's your birthday today. It's July the 13th. Um... You're turning 11. I'm going to let you come to work with me today. And then later on, I'm going to make you a birthday cake. The counselors are all looking pretty tired this morning. Of course, they're all hungover. Louise addresses them before she starts babysitting Jason. She doesn't have to today. Jason's going to go in the galley with his mom. Louise tells Barry and Claudette that they are very busted. They were not doing their work yesterday when they were peering through that cabin window or when they were leaving that shed. They're going to have extra duties tonight. And as a matter of fact, they let Alice and Bill be the head counselors today. So Jason spends the morning in the kitchen with his mom. But it doesn't go well. Pamela is far too distracted with cooking to keep a constant eye on Jason. And there are many hazards in the kitchen. Uh, Pamela uses a knife to dice ve vegetables. And we see that she is very skilled and very precise when using that knife. She has to walk away to stir a pot of food. Jason grabs the knife and starts banging it against the cutting board. Pamela has to quickly grab the knife away from Jason. She tells Jason, look, one of these days, when you're a little older, I'm going to show you how to use a knife properly. But for right now, I need you to sit down and not touch anything, and please be quiet. 
Outside, David Christie has arrived with his son, Stephen. David's going to get back to work with the boy counselors. And uh, little Stephen brought a baseball glove and a ball. Stephen has this plank of wood that he has a target painted on. And little Stephen props it up against the shed, and he begins pitching the ball to the target. And as it hits the target, it rolls back to him. And he's able to do this over and over. And being an 11-year-old boy, of course, he's pretending to call a game and, and striking someone out. Um, he does this until Jenny shows up. Jenny's parents drop Jenny off. Um, Jenny joins Stephen, and then they both notice that Louise has decided to take Jason from the galley, and Louise says she's going to walk down the path that's on the east side of the lake. It's a paved path. It goes about a quarter mile along the lake, and then it U-turns and comes back to the cabin, to the camp. On the west side of the lake, there's dirt path that goes around the lake, but it is not well managed at all. So uh, little Stephen and little Jenny go back towards the cabins. They're going to grab their fishing gear to go fishing. And Louise and Jason start walking towards the paved path. Well, Jason sees the ball and the glove, and he picks up the ball and throws it at the target. And he throws it so hard that it cracks the plank of wood in half. And when that happens, Louise kind of gets freaked out and says, you know, maybe we shouldn't wander too far around the lake because we might miss lunch. Let's just uh, let's just go back to the cabin and, and work on some puzzles. And a little Jenny and little Steven notice that broken plank of wood. Jenny gets scared. She says, you know, I, I was going to volunteer to help with Jason, but I don't think I'm going to now. Now we skip forward to late afternoon. All of the counselors are finished with their work, except for Barry and Claudette, who are going to have to clean up the mess hall, the, the dining area, while Mrs. Voorhees cleans the kitchen, the galley. All the other counselors are gathered inside the event cabin. This is the cabin where everyone, get, when they gather for special announcements inside, this is the big event cabin. This is where the counselors are expected to hang out all night long until they're ready to go to bed. The Christies don't expect them to run loose around the woods, but the thing is the Christies are going to leave at 9 o'clock at night to go home. And at that point, the counselors are going to go buck as wild. Everyone's already drinking. Uh, Bill's playing his guitar, of course. Jason, we go back to see him in the cabin, and uh, he got a new puzzle for his birthday, and he solves it very quick. We see that he's already eaten some of his cake from after lunch. And Jason actually stands up and peers out of the window of the cabin. He's waiting for his mom to come home as Louise sits there with him. Um... It's the afternoon now, late afternoon, so Jenny's parents are about to arrive to pick her up. Stephen is upset because he and Jenny tried to catch Samson all day, and they couldn't. They were fishing. The local large fish in the lake is named Samson. He always bites near that pier, and they weren't able to catch him. Jenny brags she would catch him faster than Stephen anyway. Little Stephen says, well, I'm going to be able to fish tonight because dad's going to be working and mom's going to be working at the camp until nine o'clock. I'll be able to fish at night and that's when I'm going to catch Samson. And Jenny says, well, I want to come too. <laughs> Stephen says, well, will your parents let you come back to the camp tonight? Will they let you stay later? And Jenny says, no, but they go to bed at seven o'clock. And they're very hard sleepers. Jenny said, I can get on my bicycle and within 15 minutes I can be back at the camp. No problem. She tells Stephen, just don't tell your parents that I'm coming because I'm sneaking out. 
So Jenny's parents pick her up, and of course, Jason, waiting by the window of the cabin, gets a good look at Jenny again. He's, he's got a crush, apparently. And who doesn't? Jenny was my favorite final girl. Amy Steele rocks. All right. We go to David and Bob. They're working on the last cabin they're working on for the night. This cabin is positioned right next. It's the closest cabin to where that pier is at, where his son Stephen's going to be fishing. Now, there's some brush that's obscuring the view from that cabin to the pier, but it's close enough where he can yell back and forth and communicate with his son whenever it's, the work's over and it's time for them to leave. Uh, David and Bob are fixing structural issues with that cabin, and Bob starts to ask questions about Jason. Um, David explains Jason has no problem learning or understanding, but he struggles with his emotions because he has no prospect for a social life, a regular life, and he never had a father. Jason's disabilities are mostly social and emotional, along with his <laughs> horribly disfigured, disfigured skull and face. Bob knows that it's Jason's birthday, so he says, well, how old is he? Is he 17, 18? And David said, no, he just turned 11. And once again, we get the gasp, because Jason's such a huge kid. It is night now. We're inside the event hall, and the counselors have planned their evening for what they're going to do after 9 o'clock when they all vacate the event hall. Well, Alice is fine staying there and watching Bill play guitar. She's not interested in going anywhere. Of course, Barry and Claudette are going to find a cabin and screw all night, and so is Jack and Marcy. Brenda contemplates going swimming, and Ned tells her she, she should do it in the nude. And Brenda kind of tells him no once again. At this point, fun-loving Ned is obviously upset, because this is the last night, and he's not getting anything. We go to little Jenny, who's at her house. She is sneaking out. She gets on her bicycle and she begins the quarter mile trek and she's really good. Even in the dark, she's fast. She's racing along quickly. She's very athletic. But at one point, she slows down considerably because she's conscious of a hidden danger that's ahead. There's a huge cavernous hole that's right at the path. Now, little Jenny has contemplated jumping this hole with her bicycle before. But she's never really done it. She's never tried it. It's dark, so she gets off her bike. She walks the bike around the big hole. Then she jumps on the bike and takes off like a bat out of hell again. Stephen's uh, at the end of the pier fishing. Jenny shows up. She gets her line ready. She casts it out. And once again assures Stephen she's not going to get busted. She's not going to get caught sneaking out. Her parents are very heavy sleepers. Uh, Bob and David are finishing up with the construction on that last cabin. Bob is taking off. He says good night. David begins to pick things up. David moves at a methodical pace. But he's trying to get the work done. But he has to stop a few times to catch his breath. And at one point... After Bob has walked way far away, all the way to where he can get in his truck and drive away, David puts down this group of two-by-fours and he grabs his chest. And then he starts to rub his left arm. So David starts to call out to Bob, but Bob is unaware and drives away. It appears as though David is having a heart attack. So David starts yelling for Stephen. Stephen hears him. Stephen tells uh, Jenny. Jenny says, it's not 9 o'clock yet. It's, look, something's wrong. something must be wrong. It's my dad. I got to go see. Little Stephen runs off the pier. He runs around the, the brush and sees his dad there on one knee. You got to help me. You got to get him to your mama right away. 
Stephen starts helping his dad. Now Jenny is peering through the brush, brush and she sees what's happening. She knows it's serious. She walks back toward the pier. She looks at her bike. She's about to get on her bike and go home. But then she looks at the fishing gear and decides, you know what? I'm just going to throw the line out a few more times. Um, Barry and Claudette have finally finished their cleaning duties. They go inside the galley and ask Pamela if there's anything else she needs them to do. Pamela is very nice. She said, no, I'll be finished here very shortly. Why don't you go ahead and check with Louise at my cabin before you knock off and make sure Louise doesn't need you for anything else. They say good night very politely to Pamela and Pamela is very polite and says good night to Barry and Claudette. As Barry and Claudette slowly walk toward the Voorhees cabin, they start to psych each other out about ghastly images of Jason. They talk about the uh, e horror movies that they've seen. Um, when they get to the cabin door, Around the cabin come David and uh, Stephen. David's yelling, Louise, Louise. Louise opens up the cabin door. She sees Barry and Claudette. And she says, be quiet, Jason's sleeping. They're like, well, it's not us. And then Louise sees what's happening. Her husband's having a heart attack. Louise said, oh, my God, I got to get you to the hospital right away. She tells Barry and Claudette, <laughs> Where's Mrs. Voorhees? She said she was going to be done in two minutes. She's she's on her way. She said, I, Louise says, I have to go. I have to get my husband to the hospital. Please stay with Jason until his mom gets back. I have to go. They take off to the parking lot, which is right in front of the galley. So Stephen and Louise load up David in the car. Stephen gets in the back seat. Louise runs into the galley and tells Mrs. Voorhees, I have to go. David's having a heart attack. I have to get him to the hospital right now. And it's as if um, Pamela doesn't understand the situation. She says, I'm going to be done here in a few minutes. Can't you wait? Well, he's like, no, I have to go now. Barry and Claudette are at your cabin. They're going to watch Jason until you're done. I have to leave. Pamela looks towards your cabin and she sees Barry and Claudette standing at the door. And Pamela says, I better hurry up. She runs in the galley. She starts picking the last of it up. She starts taking lights off. The Christies take off in their car. Okay, so... Uh, Barry wants to go inside the cabin and see Jason. He didn't get to see Jason. Claudette did. Claudette says, well, if you wake him up, we're going to have to watch him. If we stay out here, we don't have to watch him. As a matter of fact, his mom's going to be here any second. The Christie's just left. We're off the clock. She kisses him. Of course, these guys are irresponsible and horn dogs. And so Barry and Claudette leave. In the event cabin, Bill is finishing up another song on the guitar. Alice and Brenda clap. Ned is dejected. He sees that it's between 8.30 and 9 o'clock, and he says, screw this. I'm going somewhere else. Ned walks out of the event cabin. Brenda kind of rolls her eyes, and Bill begins another song. We start to hear thunder, and there's lightning at this point. When Barry and Claudette leave the front of the Voorhees cabin to head towards their screw place for the night. We see that Jason is awake and he's looking out the window and he sees Barry and Claudette leaving. We go to Jenny. Jenny is still fishing. She thinks she has a bite. She reels it in. It's nothing. And then she decides because of the thunder and the lightning, the rain's about to start. She needs to hurry up and book it home. So before she walks down the pier, she notices somebody walking by the lake. And she thinks it's Stephen at first, and she yells for Stephen. Then she notices the figure has a large brown 
beach towel over his head. She realizes it's Jason, and Jason sees her at the end of the pier. She freaks out. She runs down the pier. She jumps on her bike to take off. Now, Jason continues to walk around the lake towards the pier, and here comes Ned. Now, Ned is drunk. He's talking to himself, but uh, he sees Jason. Jason doesn't see him. And he decides to run up behind Jason and slam his hands on Jason's shoulders and say, boo. And when he does that, Jason turns around with a swing, hits him, and Ned goes flying several feet. He crashes into the lake shore. He's actually crashed where the water's crashing. Ned says, oh my God, holy shit. And then Ned notices that he's holding the brown beach towel that was over Jason's head. And when he looks up, he gets a good look at Jason. And Ned is terrified. Uh, Ned actually stands up and runs away from Jason actually towards the water. He starts running into the lake because <laughs> he's so scared. He turns around waist deep in the lake. And Jason is scared, and Jason starts to run away. Jason's moving towards the pier, though. He's not moving back toward the cabins. And Ned decides to get out of the lake and run back towards the cabins. Ned's freaking out. He's like, holy shit. Jason sees that Ned's running towards the cabins, so Jason decides to keep moving towards the pier. Jason notices that down the dirt path is Jenny on her bike, and she's riding away. And Jason starts to follow in that direction. Pamela turns off the last light in the galley. She walks outside. She's heading to the cabin. She sees that Barry and Claudette are no longer outside. She assumes they're inside the cabin with Jason. Pamela enters the cabin. She starts calling for Barry and Claudette. There's no answer. She looks at the bed. Jason's not there. She starts calling for Jason. There's no answer. At this point, she starts calling her name, her son's name over and over. She freaks out. She exits the cabin and she immediately heads towards the lake. Instinctively, that's where she knows she needs to go. We go back inside the event hall. Jack notices the time. It's after 9 o'clock, so him and uh, Gracie can go find a... Is that her name? Yeah, get a, Jack and Gracie can go find a cab and screw. Brenda tells Alice she feels really bad that Jed hadn't come back yet. At this point, it's pouring down rain. So Brenda puts on a raincoat. She decides to go out and look for Ned. Alice and Bill decide to pass each other a beer and keep talking. The rain's falling harder outside. Pamela gets to the lake, calling for Jason the whole time. When she gets by the lake and starts screaming Jason's name, Jason, walking along the path, hears her. Uh, as, he, as Jason was following Jenny on the bike, Jenny had to stop the bike and get off and walk around that damn hole. And that was terrifying for her because she saw Jason coming. But she was able to get back on her bike and take off again. Jason didn't notice the hole. He heard his mother's voice. He turns around. He slips in the wet mud and he falls into the hole. Now, when Jason falls into this huge ass hole. He hits his head and he's unconscious. He's not hurt, but he's unconscious. And this hole is so deep that Jason can't just simply jump up, grab the top and pull himself out. We see the hole filling up with rain. Jason's unconscious. As Pamela approaches the lake, she sees a brown beach towel floating in the water. And she immediately assumes that Jason is drowned. She dives in the lake, she swims to the blanket, she starts swimming under, she starts coming up screaming Jason's name, swimming back under, she's literally swimming in the bottom of the lake in the dark looking for her son. 
Finally, she gives up. She crawls out of the lake. She's crying. And she's pissed. You're supposed to be watching my son. You let him drown. How could you let him die? She gets up off the ground after beating her fists, everything else, and, and she starts heading back toward the galley. And at some point, Pamela's hysteria kind of gets a little measured. It's as if she's trying to connect with her son telepathically. Her son is unconscious in the bottom of that hole. Pam assumes that her son is dead. She goes in the galley. And she grabs a huge knife. Her sadness turns to anger once again. She walks out of the galley and immediately heads to the parking lot where all of the cars are. We see Barry and Claudette. They're still making love inside one of the cabins. They're taking their time, enjoying every moment. And then we see uh, Brenda. She is still wandering around the rain looking for Ned. She first went to the boys' cabin. She gets inside the boys' cabin. Ned's not there. She says, shit, she's got to put her hood back on, get back in the rain. And as she's walking away from the boys' cabin, she's approached by Pamela Voorhees. So, Brenda asks Pamela if she's seen Ned. And Pamela asks Brenda if she's seen Barry and Claudette. Uh, yeah, Brenda, Brenda tries to ask about Ned again. She doesn't take her seriously. And then Pamela starts screaming. And then Pamela reveals the knife. And then Pamela tells Brenda, you should have been paying attention. You... Let my son drown. She swings the knife. She misses Brenda. Brenda tries to turn around and run away, but Mrs. Boris plunges the knife in her back. And as they fall to the ground, Mrs. Boris plunges the knife a few more times, screaming, where are they? You let my son drown. She gets up in the rainy moonlight and the blood everywhere. And Pamela starts walking towards the rest of the cabins. In the event hall, Bill and Alice decide they're the last ones there. They decide to call it a night. Alice asks Bill if he can walk her to the girls' cabin. He says yes. Then we go back to Pamela. She is looking inside the windows of the cabins that she approaches. She's staring inside the window of one of them, and that's when drunk Ned shows up. Ned sees that Mrs. Voorhees is covered in blood and asks if she's hurt. Pamela says, I'm looking for my son, Jason. Can you help me find him? And Ned said, I saw your son, Jason. He was by the lake. Pamela said, you saw him and you let him drown. She pulls the knife up and stabs it in Ned's chest. He's gasping for air. She pulls the knife out and she stabs him in the chest again. And he quits breathing. She pulls the knife out, she stands up, and she walks towards the next cabin. Jack and Marcy are making love inside that cabin. They are so absorbed that they don't notice that Pamela is staring at them through the window. And then Pamela opens the door. The rain and the wind are blowing in. Uh, Jack's back is turned towards the front door. He's on top. Marcy can see over Jack's shoulder that Pamela's standing there with a knife, and Pamela runs straight towards them. Jack looks over, sees Pamela coming. He moves out of the way right when the knife comes down, and Pamela stabs Marcy. Uh, Marcy starts screaming. Jack stands up, and he's kind of shocked for a second, but then he pushes Pamela off of Marcy, Pamela flies to the ground and the knife goes flying. Jack instead gets on top of Marcy and puts his hands over the wound to try to stop the wound from bleeding. He's telling Marcy he's going to help her. And when he looks back at Mrs. Borey's screaming, 
what in the hell are you doing? Pamela has picked up a very heavy lamp and swings the base of it, hits Jack in the jaw, breaks his jaw. Jack starts bleeding out of his mouth and he falls straight on top of Marcy. Marcy's trying to move. She's been stabbed. She's screaming and now she's got her boyfriend bleeding on top of her. And then Mrs. Voorhees pulls Jack's hair back to reveal his throat and slices his throat. Now Jack's bleeding all over Marcy. Pamela stands up and walks out the cabin. We see Brenda covered in her own blood and Jack's blood, the broken jaw laying there on top of her. And then we see Marcy take her last breath. Pamela exits the cabin and walks towards the next nearest structure, which is the tool shed. She enters the tool shed. She puts down the large chef's knife and picks up a very large machete. And there are other things in this tool shed, tools for repairs as well as for landscaping. In the rain-soaked hole, we see Jason. He wakes up. He stands up. He tries to jump out, and he can't. At this point, he can be calling for his mama if they ch so choose to have him speak. He's getting more and more aggravated, and he begins to climb out of the hole by burying his hand in the muddy side until he can reach the roots deep within, and he pulls himself out of that hole and starts making his way down the path back towards the cabin. Alice and Bill arrive at the girls' cabin. They say goodnight, but before Bill leaves, Alice goes in and realizes that nobody else is there. You know, she's calling out for Ned. She's calling out for Brenda. So now Alice feels like she should go out and find Brenda. She figures the others are screwing, but she feels like she should go out and try to look for Ned or Brenda. And Bill agrees to join Alice. They head outside. Pamela has now reached the event cabin. She walks inside. The cabin's dark. There's nobody left in there. But she's still walking around the place, and she's begun talking to herself as if it's Jason telling her to kill them, that they can't hide. There's no place to hide. Pamela leaves the cabin, and the next cabin she gets to is the cabin with Barry and Claudette. Of course, they are making love, and Pamela does the exact same thing. She opens up the front door. She walks in, this time machete in hand. She runs straight to the couple, and she buries the machete deep in Barry's head and neck. Claudette screaming. Mrs. Voorhees tries to pull the machete out of Barry's head, but she has a hard time doing it. It's stuck in there pretty good. She's got to put her foot on Barry's body to use the force to get the machete out. Claudette has lost it. She's screaming so much. She has an opportunity at this point to run away, but she doesn't. She's in panic mode. And Pamela tells her, you were supposed to watch him. My son just drowned. Claudette is crying and screaming. You let him drown, and Pamela lifts up the machete and buries it in Claudette's face. When Claudette hits the ground, Barry and Claudette are both dead, and Pamela actually stands there and observes her work. She takes a moment with this one. Alice and Bill are approaching the boys' cabin. That's when they see Brenda's dead body laying on the ground. They start freaking out. And Bill says, we have to get to the cars and get the hell out of here. Alice said, we have to warn everybody else. Alice runs into the cabin. She's going to use the phone. Bill's begging her, let's go now. Alice picks up the phone and realizes it's dead. As they're running towards the galley in the parking lot, they're trying to figure out who killed Brenda. 
They're contemplating whether Ned did it or not. They don't know. Bill says we just have to get to the police. When they get to the parking lot, Bill pulls out his keys and opens up his door, but Alice realizes, walking to the other side of the car, that all of the car's tires are flat, including Bill's. They decide they probably can't make it to the road with flat tires, so they run into the galley. They're going to try to grab weapons. They're going to have to fight this guy. First thing Alice does is pick up the phone in the galley. The line is dead. And then we see there's another figure in the galley with a large machete. It's Pamela. And... She swings and hits Bill. I think Bill puts up a fight here. Probably gets his hand sliced in half or fingers lost or something like that. But eventually, Pamela delivers the kill shot. Bill is dead. Alice is screaming. She doesn't know what Mrs. Voorhees wants. She doesn't know what the hell is going on. And Pamela explains, you know, Today was his birthday. He was 11. I've taken care of him his whole life. I killed his father so that his father wouldn't hurt him. And now I'm going to have to kill you too. She tries to pull the machete out of Bill's head, but it's stuck and Alice decides to book it out the galley. Alice is running towards the lake. Alice gets to the lake, she grabs a canoe, she's trying to pull it to the shoreline, but she's not strong enough. She says, no way she's going to get that boat into the water fast enough. Pamela's got the machete and she's headed right her way. So Alice grabs an oar out of the canoe. They begin their fight. Jason has reached the pier. He can see his mother and Alice fighting. He begins to walk closer. Of course, the struggle ends with Pamela losing the machete. Alice grabs the machete. And Jason watches as Alice kills Pamela. I guess she can whack her head off. Pamela's dead. Alice puts the machete down. Alice lays down on the ground. She's crying. She's been through a lot. All her friends are dead. And Jason walks over and picks up the machete. Alice sees him. He's looking at his dead mother's body. He looks at his mother's head, severed head. And Jason swings and beheads Alice with one swing. Jason uh, lays down on his mom's body. Nothing happens. Jason picks up his mother's head. He puts his face on his mother's face. And then he hears his mother talking. His mother tells him he's a special boy. He's going to live a very long time. He's going to have to do exactly what she says. Jason starts to walk toward the galley carrying his mother's head. And his mother says, don't forget about the weapon. And Jason picks up the machete. He walks into the galley. His mom says, I have to show you this. And he observes all the dead bodies in there. Uh, Bill's dead body. His mother explains she was trying. He was trying to hurt you. He was trying to hurt me. If they get a hold of you, they're going to hurt you. This is what mommy had to do to, to protect you. Jason passes the tool shed. His mom's voice says, you need to go in there, grab a utility belt, and grab all the tools that you're going to need because you're going to have to survive. He goes in the cabin. He grabs everything that he can, a pillow, a blanket, some food. He goes in the galley, puts all the non-perishable food he can fit into this duffel bag. He's got a utility belt. He puts other stuff inside the bag. And Jason starts heading towards the woods.
He's walking down the dirt path along the side of the lake. When he gets to the end of the path, he can see that there's a fenced area that says private property. He doesn't go through the fence. He decides to walk deeper into the woods. And as he's walking away, his mother's telling him you can't get caught. But you're going to survive. You're a survivor and you're going to live a very long time. The next morning, Mrs. Christie pulls into the property. The birds are chirping. It's a nice, sunny summer day. She walks into the galley after noticing all the cars with flat tires. <laughs> she walks into the galley and sees Bill's corpse and she screams. I would like to get a scene next with a cop interviewing Mrs. Cunningham at her residence, asking about Pamela Voorhees. Of course, Mrs. Cunningham asks about Jason. The cops say that they didn't find any boy. And uh, the cops drag the lake. And among all the items they find is that brown beach towel, which Mrs. Cunningham confirms belonged to Jason. The cops can't imagine that an 11 year old would have killed all of these people, so they chalk it up as Jason is drowned. And the murder is a mystery. I'd like to finish the first act with a scene at the Field residence with Danny and Debbie Field trying to figure out how they're going to tell little Jenny about what happened. They're contemplating whether who could have done it. They're contemplating whether Jason had drowned or not. Jenny overhears the conversation and Jenny remembers seeing Jason following her around the lake. She's not sure if Jason drowned yet, drowned or not either. But she approaches her parents and asks them if they're going to try to reopen the camp. And they said that they don't know. And that ends Act 1. Friday the 13th. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Stay tuned to Roosevelt 10 as I present Act 2 and Act 3 later on. Until then, whistle while you're walking past the graveyard and I will see you in the trees. Bye.